Oh, hey, fancy meeting you here. You've joined me as I'm about to complete one of the quintessential chemistry reactions, and that is combining baking soda with vinegar. That is, I'm going to combine the active ingredient in vinegar, acetic acid, with the active ingredient in baking soda, or what baking soda is, sodium bicarbonate. And what I'm going to get is a double displacement reaction, or a neutralization reaction, in which we have carbonic acid, which further decomposes into water and carbon dioxide, and we have sodium acetate being produced as well. So let's take a look. You can come in a little closer. A little closer. A little clo oh, too close. Let's back up a bit. Okay. So here we go. Now you can see that carbon dioxide gas that I mentioned is producing all of those bubbles. And this is something that you've probably done numerous times before, or maybe even as young as five or six years old. But have you ever wondered, or maybe you've tried, other compounds in your house that might react with baking soda? What could they be? Let's take a look. So here I have some common household products that you could probably find around your home. I have some water, I have some lime juice, and I have some lemon soda. And of course I have some baking soda. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to combine each of these and we'll just take a look at what happens. So the first thing I'm going to do is take the baking soda and the carbonated lemon water and let's take a look. So we can see that there is a little bit of gas given off in that reaction, but we definitely do have a reaction that occurs between the lemon soda and the baking soda. Now let's take a look at what happens when we deal with the lime juice and the baking soda. And you can see certainly there, we definitely have a reaction between the lime juice and the baking soda. Now what about water? What do you think is going to happen with water? Nada. Nothing. So why is it then that the lime juice and the carbonated soda reacted with the baking soda while water didn't? And why is it then that the vinegar reacted? Well, all three of those substances that reacted with the baking soda were acids. Water, while it can act as an acid, isn't generally classified as an acid. It's a neutral substance. So, well up until this point, all we've really done with acids is learn how to name them. And in naming acids, we've identified the fact that when we look at a formula, if that formula contains a hydrogen at the beginning, and it's been dissolved in water, that is we put an aqueous subscript at the end, it's a pretty fair bet that it's going to be an acid. And we've learned that these acids typically can be classified as binary acids, that is by bonding with, say, a group 7 element, or they can be oxy acids by binding with a polyatomic ion that contains an oxygen. And we can even look a little closer and see that in terms of their structure anyway, it appears that we have a hydrogen bonded covalently to another um, atom. So in the case of hydrogen chloride, hydrochloric acid, we have hydrogen covalently bonded to chlorine. But there's got to be some other way, aside from just looking at the formula, that we can identify acids and bases. So what makes an acid an acid? Well, short answer is it depends on who you ask. Well, if you ask this guy here, Svante Arrhenius, who was, amongst other things, a Swedish chemist, physicist, Nobel Prize winner, and part-time bow-tie model, he came up with the idea that we could classify acids and bases depending on the ions that they produced when in solution. So, for example, under his definition, an acid was a substance that, when ionized in water, would form hydrogen ions, whereas a base would dissociate and produce hydroxide ions. So under his definition, an acid is a substance that produces hydrogen ions in solution, and a base is something that produces hydroxide ions in solution. And if you notice the hydroxide ion and the hydrogen ion, if they were to come together in solution, what do you think they'd form? Well, if we look at it, there's two hydrogens there, there's one oxygen, and we know a really common compound that can be formed from two hydrogens and one oxygen. That's right, we have water. And this is part of a process that we refer to, in a term that you're probably familiar with, as neutralization. And in neutralization of an acid and a base, that is when an acid and a base react together, like say hydrochloric acid and sodium hydroxide, you will notice that the hydrochloric acid under the Arrhenius definition has that hydrogen, the base under the Arrhenius definition has that hydroxide. When an acid and a base come together, they will go through a neutralization process and form water, 
our H2O, and salt. So the hydrogen that's in the hydrochloric acid in this case, the hydroxide that's in the sodium hydroxide, they will come together and form HOH, or more commonly known as water. Now we also notice that we have a salt produced in this reaction, and I know normally we classify salt, or think about salt, as table salt, and in fact this is kind of what is formed in this particular reaction. But in an acid-base reaction, the ionic substance that's produced as a result is what we classify as a salt. So generally speaking, a um, salt is something that is formed from an acid-base neutralization reaction. And there are these two gentlemen here, Nicholas Bronsted and Thomas Lowry, who built upon the ideas of Arrhenius. You see, there were some instances where acids and bases didn't produce hydrogen ions or hydroxide ions in solution, but still behaved as an acid or a base in a particular reaction. So the focus instead became on the reaction and what happened to the proton. And those substances that donated a proton became classified as acids, and those substances that accepted a proton became classified as a base. And so if we look at an example in which ammonia reacts in water, if we just looked at ammonia, you might predict that ammonia, NH3, is an acid because it has hydrogens there. But in fact, none of these hydrogens are acidic hydrogens, that is, they're not donated. If we actually looked at this mechanism, you would see that it appears that water loses or donates a hydrogen. Ammonia accepts one and becomes the NH4+, or ammonium ion, in this process. So in fact, water here is the proton donor and we classify it as the acid. Ammonia is the proton acceptor and we classify it as the base. Now if we look on the other side, that is the product side of this acid-base reaction, what we see is that we have two compounds that could potentially in subsequent reactions act as an acid or a base. So that is, the ammonium ion, NH4, could donate its hydrogen that it just received, and the hydroxide ion, the OH negative, could accept a hydrogen. So we say that these are conjugates in this acid-base reaction, and we refer to the ammonium ion, because it could donate its proton as the conjugate acid of ammonia, and we refer to the hydroxide ion, because it could theoretically act as a base in accepting a hydrogen, as the conjugate base of water. So we identify conjugate acid-base pairs in a Bronsted-Lowry acid-base definition. And so typically what we have to do in a reaction is identify the acid and the base, the conjugate acid and the conjugate base, and identify any conjugate acid-base pairs. And this is how we would go about it. So this is a scenario under which we have a base reacting with water. Well, let's take a look at one in which we have an acid reacting with water. So if we take a look at this reaction here, in which we have a relatively common acid, as you know, hydrochloric acid, in the presence of water, producing H3O+, which is really just a complex that we come to know as the hydronium ion, or hydroxonium ion, which is just a representation of the hydrogen ion and a water molecule coming together to form this H3O plus ion, and a chloride ion. What I want you to do is to identify the acid, the base, the conjugate acid, the conjugate base, and any conjugate acid-base pairs that we have here. So hit pause, go ahead and give it a shot. Did you do it? Well, let's take a look. In this case, it looks like the hydrochloric acid, HCl, is donating a hydrogen to water, therefore forming the hydronium ion and the chloride ion. So of course here, because hydrochloric acid is donating a proton, it is, no surprise, the acid. Water is acting as a base, and we have, on the conjugate side of this, the hydronium ion being the conjugate acid, and the chloride ion being the conjugate base. Now in terms of the conjugate acid-base pairs, we have HCl and the chloride ion being one pair, and we have H2O and the hydronium ion, H3O+, being the other pair. And you can always identify conjugates because one has to be an acid on one side and a base on the other, or vice versa, a base on one side and an acid on the other. But you'll also notice that they only differ by one hydrogen, that is one proton. So HCl and the chloride ion only differ by one proton. H2O and H3O plus only differ by one proton or one hydrogen ion. Now I know you might be saying, hmm, water was an acid in that last reaction, now it's a base. How is that possible? Well, water is one of these substances that we say is amphoteric, that is, it can exist or behave as either an acid or a base. And you can even refer to it as amphiprotic, that is, it can donate both a proton and accept a proton, depending on what it's reacting with. So you may come across substances sometimes, like water, that can exist both as an acid and a base. 
So up until this point in your chemistry careers, you've probably identified acids and bases on their physical or observable characteristics. So acids taste sour, or bases feel slippery, or taste bitter. But the important thing to understand after watching this video is that acids and bases aren't defined on observable characteristics, or at least observable characteristics alone. They're based on what they do in a chemical reaction. So you should have an understanding of Arrhenius' definition of an acid and a base, and Bronsted and Lowry's definition of an acid and a base. And hopefully after watching this video, you're able to do that. Thanks for watching. Did you like this video? Did you not like the video? Was there something that seemed like it was a little off? Well, either way, we want to hear about it. So like us or leave a comment in the section below as to things that we could change or improve. And if you want to see more videos like this, you can subscribe to our channel on YouTube or follow us on Twitter.